Next from Springfield, we attend a meeting of the State University's Annuitants Association and hear from two members of the Illinois Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability. Executive Director of CONCFA Dan Long talks about the challenges facing Illinois' budget and economy. Pension analyst Dan Hankowitz speaks on the status of Illinois' pensions and retirement systems. This runs about 50 minutes. Well, thank you, Linda, for that kind introduction and for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, Illinois economy and, and budgets are facing some difficult challenges, and we would like to outline some of those issues for you. We'll briefly discuss some of the economic data, then talk about... Is the mic on? Oh, there we go. Okay, error. All right. Well, we'll start over, but we're briefly going to discuss some economic data, then talk about state revenues, budget, business climate in Illinois, and, of course, pensions. Uh, as Linda mentioned, each of you have a handout. Um, there's a lot of detailed information, so sometimes it's easier to probably follow that, that handout. Let me see how this works here, how I move this forward. There we go. Uh, as Linda mentioned, we're a bipartisan commission. We have uh, six representatives, six senators. Uh, we're currently co-chaired, as shown here, by Senator Michael Frerichs out of Champaign and Representative Jill Tracy out of um, uh, Quincy. She gave you an idea of what we do, and that's out highlighted there on, on page three. But uh, in the interest of time, there's a lot of economic data, and I think I'm going to go ahead and skip to, uh, to page 13, which, which deals with the state employment. Illinois' employment, like the U.S., has shown, si has shown gains, but remains at extremely low levels as illustrated in this chart. Um, well, it took five years for the U.S. employment. Well, it took five years. U.S. employment again last month finally recouped all the jobs lost during the 2007 recession. In contrast, Illinois never did recoup those losses in the previous recession before the latest recession set in at the end of 2007. Prior to the recession, um, we had a high employment, about 6.4 million people employed. That was about mid-2007. We dropped down during the Great Recession to 5.8 million around January 2010, and we're currently currently at about 6 million. That's of April of 2014. So we've uh, we're still at least 400,000 less than were employed prior to the Great Recession. Session. So the gap to reach a new high in employment in the current recovery is going to be even more more difficult for for Illinois. I'm going to go to, to page 14. Um, I went too far. Today. Unemployment rates, as shown in chart 11, as a result of job losses during the recession, the national unemployment rate rose from a high of 4.4 percent in late 2006 and early 2007 to a high of 10 by October of 09. By January 2012, the unemployment rate had edged down to 8.2 and fell to 6.3 percent in April and May of this year. Much of the recent decline came from people dropping out of the workforce as the participation rate fell to its lowest level since 1978. In fact, some economists uh, said at 62.8%, the employment to population ratio is shockingly low. The unemployment rate in Illinois continues to trail the U.S. by a wide gap. Illinois' rate hit 7.9% in April, but there remains a wide disparity with that of the, of the nation. We've been trailing about 2%. We're a little better than that now but we've been about 2% below the, the rest of the country. Page 17 shows, this is a comparative rates between Illinois, the U.S., and the Midwest. Starting in 2007, prior to the recession at year in, Midwest and Illinois rates were similar and only slightly higher than the nation. Since 2010, unemployment in the Midwest fell below the national rate, and this continued through 2012, because the manufacturing had improved. Unemployment in Illinois, however, began to exceed the national and Midwest rates, and that gap has continued to increase further, as you can see in this chart. Go to page uh, 17. And this is some of the numbers. We use a uh, global insight, and they do a optimistic and a pessimistic and, and a baseline, and this is the baseline which has a 60% chance of occurrence. The first here on page 18 or on page 17 shows the the national numbers. Gross domestic product you can see has been trolling along at you know fiscal 11 at two and a half percent and 2.3, 2.0, 1.6. 
15 we're going to estimate to be 3.2 and then 16 3.1 you got to have three or three and a half percent growth if you're going to make any dent in the unemployment rate and you go down at the bottom of that that chart there uh you see the unemployment rate 9.3 percent 11 down to 6.8 in fiscal 14 and projected to be dropped about 5.8 percent in fiscal 16. the next page shows illinois and you can see our gross state products same. I mean, we generally, about 97% of what goes on nationally uh, impacts what goes on in the state. But you can see we're at 2.1 in 2012, 1.5, 2.2, 2.7. Going to get to 3.0 in 16 and 17. But the unemployment rate, we were at 9 uh, in 2014. The actual uh, average dropped 8. Well, dropped 8.3, 7.9%, almost 8% average for 2015. 7.3 in 2016 is the estimate, and we'll still be at 7% even out to 2017. So you can see that Illinois is going to take, uh, it's going to be a while before we, we recover uh, the jobs that have lost if we ever recover them all. Uh, we're going to go to page 20 now, talk about revenues. And of course, the economy has a direct impact on revenues. First, 2014, that's the year we're in now. It's going to end at the end of this month. And the, the, the legislature adopted uh, back in May House Resolution 389, which set the revenue estimate at $35.446 billion. Of course, during the year, revenues could come in higher and lower, but it was a very conservative estimate, and we indicated that, that at the time that we presented it. Um, in November of 13, we did an adjustment. We adjusted it upward $369 million, mainly because sales tax were doing better, and there was more money in what they call the refund fund. Um, we made another adjustment in February and March of $258 million. Uh, corporate in tax, income tax did better, sales tax. We lowered a couple items, but the net adjustment was $258 million. And then we were concerned because a year ago in April, we got like over a billion dollars, and, and this was back in April of, of, of 13. And so we were concerned about how much of that, a lot of it was one time as a result of tax changes being made at the federal level. So we didn't build all that into the base. So we wanted to wait till we saw how revenues came in in April, and they came in a little better than we expected, and so we made another adjustment in May of this year of uh, 588 million, 467 million from personal income tax, and then some of the other sources. So during the course of the year, that also set the new base for the next year at 36.661 billion. But over the course of the year, $1.2 billion more came in in revenue than what the budget was based upon. And that's a good thing, because as you know, the tax is going to drop off, and so it makes the uh, uh, putting the budget together for this year a little bit easier. Go to the next page here on, on 21, and this is the 15 outlook. Uh, the, of course, the revised estimate in that little box there on, on your left at the bottom, the 36.661 billion I just mentioned, that was the base coming out of 14. And then you've got which we didn't know until recently, whether or not the taxes would be extended or it was going to allow to, to uh, be reduced. And of course, it has been extended, so the budget's based on um, the taxes going down to personal 3.75 and, and corporate to around 7. And you can see we're losing uh, 1.6 billion in personal income tax, 427 million in corporate, sales tax is going to increase, then we got some other sources down, transfers in will be down because we don't have uh, some of that uh, money from the refund fund. And then we expect federal sources to increase. So the estimate for 14, 34.662 billion, down just about 2 billion. But as I said, the budget was based on um, a billion two less than what we actually received. So you don't have to actually cut 2 billion, but you have to cut somewhere less uh, around a billion. Uh, the next page is just a comparison between our numbers and the governor's office of management and budget. We're, we're very similar in 14 after the adjustments, only four million off. They're uh, about 300, 200 some million dollars higher than us going into to 2015. Go to page 23, and this was the governor's recommended budget. On March 26th, the governor presented his vision for 2015, which included making the income tax permanent, as well as some uh, other revenue changes. Uh, the current law, $34.934 billion is the, the governor's estimate for, for uh, 20, 2014, going into 2014. And then they would extend the tax increase for both corporate and personal tax. That increased income tax revenue by $2.712 billion. 
They propose utilizing taking a 650 million in interfund borrowing, which we'll see in a minute, is also in the current budget. And then there was uh, would have been some increased uh, uh, revenue from federal sources as a result of paying down more Medicaid med Medicaid bills of a couple hundred million. So the proposed FY15 budget by the government was 38.575 billion. It also included the property tax rebate. We were going to do away with the credit and um, give certain homeowners a 500 or just a $500 rebate for all the homeowners. But that didn't that didn't occur. And on page 24, House Joint Resolution 100. In the last days of the spring session, both chambers passed HR, HR 100. The resolution contained the revenue forecast to create the 15 budget. The underpinnings of the forecast were our, for, our revenue estimate, the COGFA estimate of, of 34.662 billion. And to that, they, they are gonna utilize the 650 million. There's several hundred other funds in state treasury in addition to the general revenue fund. And so they're gonna borrow money, 650 million from these other funds, and they'll have to pay that back over 18 months. Uh, and that helps, helps cover that lost revenue for, for at least fiscal 2015. And it increased some statutory transfers by about 40 million. So after incorporating these two changes uh, to the COGFA forecast, the total general revenue estimate for 2015 is 35.352 billion. You remember the governor wanted 38, so it's still short, and it, it indicates that most of most of the budgets are flat. There's no increase. Um, the pension payment is being made, which but the pension inc increase is, is rather small this year. So, uh, so we'll go to the next page, and this is the this is actually the budget plan in summary from fiscal 2010 to 2015. There's a lot of numbers on here, but I'm just going to point out a couple of things. First, the very top the revenue line. You can see that in 2010, we were at 27.3 billion. Um, we're gonna be at about 35 billion, so we've had, we've had significant revenue in increases. If you look at the next line there, the appropriations, see the appropriations really haven't gone up significantly, 27, 6.3, and it's, it's pretty much stayed static for the most part. But you look at the, um, you look at down to the pension contributions, and you can see that in, in FY10, it was 3.466 billion. Well, in FY9 and FY10, the first time in the history, we had a drop off two years in revenues. We lost 515 million in 09. We lost over 2 billion in fiscal 2010. So there was a proposal back then that we had to cut spending. We would have to cut spending. We didn't, there was no way to do it because there wasn't enough revenue. But what we did is you see the 3.466 billion contribution in 2010 for pensions. We took that money and we put it in base spending. So we didn't have to make cuts, which made it, means it put spending at a level that wasn't supported by revenues. In addition to that, you could not just not make any pension payments, so we borrowed that money. We borrowed $3.466 billion in FY10. And so then you get to FY11, we don't get $3 billion in, in national revenue growth. So you see the $3.680 billion, about three point seven. we borrowed that too. So over those two years, we borrowed $7.1 billion in short-term notes which cost the state a billion a year in debt service. It will cost a billion in debt service between now and 2019. That, right after we did that, of course, you can see where um, the, the unpaid bills just mushroomed up to about nine billion. So you get to fiscal year 2012, and you can see that at that point, you, you had to pass tax increase, and they did. They increased the taxes, the, the income tax, the corporate and, and, and personal income tax. So the first 4.135 billion had to go back in the base there for pensions. Because you couldn't keep borrowing. You'd already borrowed seven billion. You couldn't keep borrowing for pensions. So we had to put that money back in the base. Then in 13, of course, we had a drop in the stock market. And so when that happens, you only get revenues for pensions from, from investments, from, um, from employee contributions and state contributions. Well, the state had to make an additional contribution. So it increased a billion dollars. Then it went from five one uh, to about almost six billion, so it increased almost another 900 million in 2014. And so that was kind of taking all the, all the revenue growth that we hear about. Now you can see that the next year it's only going up a couple hundred million because um, in 13, what, or in fiscal 14 what happened was that the, the systems lowered their assumed rate of return from eight and a half percent down to 7.75 for SURS and SERS and down to eight for teachers. Well, that also required the state then to put in more money. So you can see what, 
what happened with, with a lot of the, with the money from the tax increase, for the most part, a lot of it went to pensions and to some increased Medicaid. Um, you go down just a couple lines there, they're indented there, where it says pension obligation and bond debt service. And you can see it was 564 million. That was the, that was the uh, 30 year pension obligation bonds, which are paid off by the pension systems from their investments. But then you see it jumped to 1.667 billion. That, that's the extra billion for those notes that comes right off the top out of GRF. Um, you can see the operating deficit in, in, in 10 was almost 4.8 billion, dropped to 3.8, down to 477, and now we're, we're in the black in terms of at least the operating. When you get down to the bottom line, budget deficit, end of year, was 6 billion, and that doesn't include all the bills. It was really close to nine because not all the Medicaid bills are included in there. And then it uh, was 4.5 and almost five and, and 12. Uh, down to 3.9. You can see now uh, going into this, this, this year, it's about you know three and a half. Like I said, that's not all the bills. I think the comptroller's estimate are going to end the year around five billion or so. But we are getting much better in terms of payments uh, outside of the state employees group insurance program, where we continue to carry over about a billion five, and some of those payments are are, are still uh, taking over a year to, to pay. So that's kind of the budget summary. We go to page 27, we we'll skip 26. 26 just shows that general fund balance. You can see the huge drop off into the negative, and now we can see where we're starting to recover. Uh, but on page 27, I mentioned about the pension obligation bonds, and the, on the outside is the, is, is the pension obligation bonds. On the inside, where it's highlighted, are the pension obligation notes. And you can see across there, there were two series. We, we issued them in 2011, and then we had to issue them again in 2012. And you can see the debt service is about a billion dollars. We get a little break in fiscal year 16, where it's uh, right around 800 million, and then it's a billion, billion, billion. But uh, once those are paid off in 2019, that's what they, in Senate Bill 1, uh, where they talked about, well, in addition to the regular contribution, we're, we're, we're gonna make an additional billion dollars contribution. That's this money, once the bonds are paid off. Since it was already going towards pensions, uh, they, they decided, well, they just continue to, to make that in addition in addition to the, the certified amount that the, the, uh, the systems certify. Of course, that's all right now in the courts, and we'll see what happens with that. But, uh, page 28 just shows the uh, highlights of the income tax increase. Uh, the base started at $9.8 um, billion there in fiscal 2010. The maroon parts would be, is base revenues. The blue part is the increase from taxes, and you can see that in, uh, 13 and 14, we're, we're getting nearly $8 billion more in revenue. So the, the, the income tax increase has, uh, has worked as it was designed, and, and we are getting significantly more revenue. Like I showed you, though, a lot of that got taken up um, in, in uh, other payments, for, particularly for pensions. Uh, page 29, this just shows the uh, going into 14, the, the new tax revenue from the, from the tax increase, $7.762 billion. And you can see that in 15, it goes down to 5.827 when the, uh, when the rates, rates, rates decline. So that's about a little less than 2 billion, right around 2 billion. But the big problem, and what's been talked about quite a bit, is when you get to 16. Because only, the rates don't drop till halfway through fiscal 15, not till January of 15. But in 16, you get the full impact, and it's, it's right 4.8 billion, almost 5 billion. Some would say it's even higher than that. Um, but that's where you're going to have a, a real problem in trying to, to balance, balance the budget. You know, definitely requires some significant, significant reductions. Okay, I'm going to go now to page 31. We're going to talk a little bit about the state's business climate. And the budget has a definite impact on the state's business climate. Each year, the commission is charged with preparing an economic report for the state. And we always contract with Moody Analytics to do this. And these are some excerpts from the report. Uh, Illinois' economy is struggling to get back on its feet. Although it has shown progress very recently, the state has been among the Midwest's weakest over the past year and since the national recovery took hold mid-2009. Illinois ranked in the bottom one-third of Midwest states in jobs, income, and output in 2013. There are some positive signs, however. A decline in foreclosures is helping housing. Manufacturing is no longer backpedaling, and consumers are benefiting from an increase in wealth and better credit quality. Illinois economy is posed to strengthen, but severe state budgetary problems and poor population trends will act as a speed limit on growth. Consequently, while improvement in housing and manufacturing will ensure that Illinois' economy grows a little bit faster this year and next, 
The pickup is projected to be modest and will not be enough to narrow the state's performance gap with, with the region and nation. Longer, longer term, Illinois has a lot of what businesses need to thrive, talent, access to customers and capital, transportation, but painful fiscal reforms are needed before it can fully capitalize on these strengths. Pension reform still faces significant legal challenge and a partial rollback of the temporary income tax rate increase will dramatically reduce revenue starting in fiscal 15. The state's demographics present it with another challenge as an aging population coupled with a trend toward fewer workers hampers job and income gains which are forecast to be below average over the extended forecast horizon. Business tax incentives. Um, this has become a big issue uh, in Illinois in terms of the corporate, the benefits that we, we give to corporations to, to locate and expand in Illinois. And they benefit from about $1.15 in business-related tax incentives, the breakdown, sales tax incentives, $523 million. Individual income tax, about $28 million. Corporate income tax incentives, $310 million. Other tax incentives, around $300 million. Uh, the business tax incentives with the largest cost, Illinois not, net operating loss deduction for corporations, about $219 million. Manufacturing, assembly, machinery, equipment exemptions, $183 million. Retailers discount, $121 million. Sales tax for use other than motor vehicles, $116 million. Rolling stock sales exemption, $74 million. The House Revenue Committee had hearings during the session on all of these incentives, and of course, uh, the businesses testified in favor, but they did make some changes, particularly to the edge tax credit. Recently enacted legislation impacting tax incentives, of course, the Chicago Mer Mercantile Exchange was threatening to leave the state. We made some changes in the way that their taxes are calculated, and that uh, is estimated to cost about $100 million a year. Sears uh, has also gotten some, some uh, relief through the edge tax credit program about 15 million a year, and this is the second time that's been afforded them, and Champion Laboratories. Well, once you start giving these out, well, then you have other businesses that want the same thing, and so then we had ADM that wanted uh, some incentives to move from Decatur to Chicago, Univar, Office Max, Office Depot. The legislation passed the Senate and it stalled in the House. I mean, they, I think that a lot of members thought, why are we giving these tax incentives to these, to these companies? And so that also prompted a review of some of these incentives. Now, there weren't many changes made other than the edge tax credit. Rather than going to these big corporations, I think they're going to try to target more towards small and medium-sized companies and make assurances that there's actually jobs being created and retained in order to get the credit. Um, I mentioned, you know, and Moody's included in the report about Illinois' demographic problem. And we are one of the top three moving away states. In fact, you can see only uh, New York, we're, we're number two. New Jersey's one, Illinois is two, New York is three. And you can see that 60, over 60% 60 of, the, of, the, of the moves are out of Illinois. And so we are, we're not growing, our population isn't growing, and we do have a demographics problem, which, which was indicated in the Moody's report. Um, expected job growth in 2014, this is again uh, Moody Analytics projection, and see Illinois is ranked 40th, uh, with job growth of only 1.21%. So we're we're quite a ways behind a number of other states. Uh, we do benefit from having a number of Fortune 500 companies, <clears throat> about 32 of them located in Illinois. However, you can see number 26, Office Max, has already moved to Florida, moved out of state. And there's been talk in, in the press of Walgreens, who is owned now by a multinational company, of moving their headquarters actually completely out of the country. Corporate liability, you hear a lot that you know corporations don't pay income tax, and I think this chart tends to, tends to verify that. Um, those are the million dollars or more, there is only, of, well, let's go to this. Of 111,500 filers, the, those with the liability, there's only 33,600 that paid a tax, 30.1%, and their uh, total liability about 1.7 billion, um, and, and the average liability about 52,000. And of that, 303 of those, or 3% of the filers, uh, accounted for 67 percent of the total total corporate liability. Um, corporate income tax, Illinois has got a, uh, a nine and a half percent rate. Um, there was it was seven and when they increased the corporate and individual tax increase, Illinois went up nine and a half. There's only two states higher, Pennsylvania at about that 9.99 and Minnesota at 9.8. And so that's somewhat of a disincentive as well, I think, for companies to locate in the state. 
Uh, business climate, in a survey of businesses when asked on, on page 41, in a survey of businesses when asked the question, how important is the state's business climate when first evaluating potential locations for a project, 87% of the respondents said either very important or somewhat important. There's, I'm gonna go through four studies that have been done on business climate. The first is the Tax Foundation, an independent organization that ranks all the states. You see Illinois' ranking is 31st. Corporate income tax were 47th. Now individual income tax, and there's been talk about moving to a, uh, a progressive income tax. We're actually ranked fairly well because of our, our flat tax in this category. Sales tax, 33rd, unemployment tax, 43rd, property tax, 44th. Overall ranking went from 23rd in 2011 to 31st in 2014. The Small Business Entrepreneur Council on page 43, we're ranked 35th overall ranking in this, in this uh, uh, study. And you can see again, um, corporate, corporate tax, 47th, corporate capital gains tax, 47th, property tax is 40th. So you'll see a trend as you go through these where we're kind of ranked very low in these some of these categories. Um, Beacon Hill Institute at Suff Suffolk University in Boston, uh, they hold themselves out as one that's really looked at and one of the more better studies. And they look not only at competitive disadvantages but also advantages. Illinois ranked 38th in this study. Uh, state and local taxes uh, per capita, 39th. Again, workers' comp, 47th. Bond rating, which we'll talk about in a minute, 49th. Um, unemployment rate, 47th. So, and uh, page 45 just has some more of the rankings related to this study, where we're 38th. On page 46, the American Legislative Exchange Council. This is a very conservative group, so this might be somewhat an outlier. We're ranked 47th. Uh, again, though, um, domestic migration. In, in this, we were at 43rd in 08 and 48th in 2012. On page 47, it's got more of the detailed rankings. Uh, top marginal corporate tax rate, again, 44th. Um, inheritance taxes, 50th. Uh, debt service, 44th. Some of the reasons why we rank lower in this particular study. So what do these rankings really tell us? Well, Illinois was in the lower half of all these business climate rankings. And Illinois' rank average for the four studies was 38th which makes them the 44th ranked state overall and the lowest ranked state in the Midwest region. Now critics of these rankings argue that it's extremely difficult to measure and rate a state's business climate because the needs of different businesses and facilities vary too widely. But regardless of the validity of the rankings, these results create a perception that Illinois is a below average business climate state. This is a stigma that Illinois has to overcome to attract and retain new businesses. Uh, on page 49, this is a uh, business site selection survey. What do companies look at when they're looking to, at a state? They look at labor costs, highway accessibility, skilled labor, and it really, you, you don't get to taxes until you get down to seventh where corporate tax rate, ninth for tax exemptions, and then state and local incentives. Page 50, uh, the state's bond sales and ratings. Uh, the top parts are listing the recent bond sales. Uh, and then you've got Moody's, Moody's are, are, first of all, we're the lowest, lowest bond rating of any state in, in the country. And you see that Moody's downgraded us in June of 2013 from A2 to A3. Uh, four state public universities were downgraded from A2 to A3 in March 2013. Eight state public universities are on the watch list for possible downgrades due to the receipts of state funding, payments of which have been consistently late. Fitch downgraded Illinois in June of, of 2013 from A to A minus, um, and Fitch also downgraded Illinois Sports Facility Authority. And then we're, we're on the watch list as well for, for further downgrades. The uh, page 51 is just a history of the bond ratings, and we've gone down for a number of years. I don't think we've had an upgrade since about 1997 or 2000. So, and you can see we're A minus and A3, so we're one, one grade above the B category at this point. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dan Hankowitz and let him talk about some retirement issues. Okay, well, thank you again for having us here today. And Linda, on behalf of organic farmers everywhere, I want to thank you for that warm introduction. I'm going to talk about some pension basics, the financial condition of the state retirement systems. 
I'm going to talk about some of the recent legislative enactments, most notably the Two-Tier Act of 2010, and of course, Senate Bill 1, the big reform uh, measure that passed last year. Now, I just want to say right at the outset that Senate Bill 1 affects Dan and I just as much as all of you, so when we get to talking about that, please don't, please refrain from throwing the remnants of lunch up at the, the podium. <laughs> So there are five state retirement systems. I think this is all pretty basic. Teachers, state employees, universities, judges, and general assembly. When we look at active member headcount by system, TRS is of course the largest, followed by SURS, SCRS, and judges and GA are really very tiny. Those are very small systems. There's been a lot of talk lately about, well, maybe the state workforce is too bloated, state workers are overpaid. So here we're looking at average salaries by system. And our, our good friends at Reboot Illinois had a little blurb on their uh, Facebook page over the weekend about state employee salaries and are we really overpaid. I just want to kind of hit some of the highlights of that. Illinois has the lowest concentration, according to the Reboot Illinois study, the lowest concentration of state employees per citizen, one for every 122 citizens, Florida is number two, and Illinois ranks eighth in full-time state employee pay, and California is number one. So Illinois state employees get paid fairly well, but there aren't that many of us anymore. It's a, it's a downward trend, especially since some of the early retirement incentives in the early 2000s. So we'll get into some of the numbers, and what we're looking at here is just a summary of the unfunded liabilities. We, we break it out by system, but if we look at the bottom line, at that 97.5 billion, that really kind of tells the whole tale of the tape. That is the cumulative unfunded liability. In a, in a perfect world, we would have $165.5 billion worth of assets on hand to match the total accrued liability and we would have a funding ratio of 100%. As you can see, we come up very far short of that. We have a 41.1% funding ratio, which puts us dead last in the country. When we look at the trend over time, it's gone up, obviously, and we get asked a lot, well, why does this happen? Why does it go up year after year? Well, back in 1995, when the legislature passed the 50-year plan, they really kind of institutionalized the underfunding. And they really sort of kicked the can down the road. And it wasn't really until about 2033 when the payments were projected to be large enough to start to pay down the unfunded. So when you have a funding plan that deliberately underfunds, you leave yourself open and susceptible to, I guess, what you would call external shocks, like the 2000 two recession, the post 9-11 recession, and then of course the 2008 crash. So those are kind of those big spikes, and the funding plan was never adequate to handle the normal cost plus the interest to begin with. So that's why it goes up. And just looking at the funding ratio chart, we're looking at the same thing, but kind of just an inverse. The funding ratio goes down over time again, the post 9-11 recession is the first dip. The 2008 stock market meltdown is the second big dip. We've stabilized a little bit in recent years, but make no mistake about it, Illinois has a severely, severely underfunded pension system. Again, we'll talk a little bit about why this changes, why the unfunded liability grows. So we try to isolate the factors that cause the growth. The largest, and this is what the actuaries compile every year when they do the valuations of the systems, the largest contributing factor is insufficient state contributions, not putting in what the actuaries tell us to put in. Investment returns, investment returns over the long haul that did not meet the assumed rates of return. There have been some benefit increases in the early 2000s and the late 1990s. There were formula upgrades, as I'm sure all of you know. And then there were some changes in assumptions. Every time the assumed rate of return is rolled back, that increases the accrued liability. More money has to go in. And then other miscellaneous actuarial factors 
contribute as well. So I mentioned that we're the worst state in terms of our unfunded liability, and I, I pulled together a little survey from Governing Magazine. This was as of 2011. It was the most recent one that I could find, but I've arranged sort of the worst offenders from left to right. Illinois comes in at dead last, of course, followed by Kentucky, Connecticut, Louisiana, New Hampshire, and so forth. Anybody want to venture a guess as to who has the best, the best funded? They're a neighbor of ours. Wisconsin, yes. Governor Walker takes all the credit for that, by the way. Yeah, right. So we'll, we'll get into some of the recent enactments. The first big one was the 2010, the two-tier bill that passed, uh, which only affected new employees. Those employees hired after January 1st, 2011. It raised the retirement age. It lengthened the uh, period of salary upon which the annuity is based to the high, highest eight out of the last 10 years. It capped the final average salary at roughly the Social Security uh, base, and it, that is indexed to grow with inflation. Annual increases, which had therefore been compounded, 3% compounded, are now non-compounded. They're the lesser of 3% or half inflation. So those were some pretty significant changes for new employees. And when that bill passed, I kind of operated on the assumption, well, we get a, a kind of a big watershed pension bill once every decade. So we won't, they won't mess with tier, tier one people. Well, they came almost immediately on the heels of uh, the two-tier bill. And the discussions began about, well, what do we do with tier one people? What can we do? This was really the culmination of a, a two-year process, but really it goes back to 2009 when the legislature formed a task force to look into this. At that time, we didn't talk too much about tier one folks, but again, after the two-tier bill passed, Senate Bill 1946 in 2010, the focus kind of pivoted to tier one. The savings weren't enough, and so you had two different conflicting approaches in 2013. You had Speaker Madigan's approach, which was really very similar to what ended up being in the final Senate Bill 1. And then, of course, Senate President Cullerton had his Senate Bill 2404, which was based on a consideration model that if we're going to ask people to give up a compounded COLA, or if you're going to ask someone to give up any kind of a benefit, you have to give them something in return. And so the consideration he had in mind was access to health care. But this is what ended up passing. It, it gradually increases the retirement age on a graduated scale. And that also applies to what we call the Rule of 85 and SERS, doesn't apply to SURS. Cost of living adjustments, we're doing away with compounding for, for tier one folks. So it'll be calculated as, as the lesser of 3% or the 3% uh, of the annuitant's pension or $30 per year of service credit $24 per year for those coordinated with Social Security. So the intent here, and this was uh, spearheaded by S Senate Republican Leader Redonio, was to preserve compounding for those lower earning annuitants, but to, to do away with compounding for some of, the, some of the higher earning ones. The bill also skips COLAs, and, there were, and I just look at two of the most kind of extreme examples. If you're over 50, you would miss your second COLA if you're an active employee. If under 44, you would miss five COLAs. So really the only tangible benefit to retiring before the bill goes into effect, and it won't go into effect due to the judge's ruling, and we can talk about that, but really the only thing that you would have missed was the second COLA delay if you're over 50. I mentioned earlier how the state had never adequately funded the pensions. And so when we get to talking about, well, what was the consideration, what was the legal consideration in this bill, this is what the sponsors would point to, that we're promising to pay down the, I heard a snicker there when I said promise. <laughs> we're promising to pay down the pension liability over 30 years. We're gonna to get to 100% over a 30 year period. We're going to implement an ARC, an actuarially required contribution 
And that last dot point is also part of the consideration. If the state does not, in any given year, make the required contribution, the retirement systems can go to court to force them to do so. So again, not a lawyer, but just in listening to the debate and listening to the proponents of the bill, yes, you're getting a lower COLA. Yes, you are giving up some very tangible benefits, but they would argue that we're giving you a more a better funded system, and we're giving you the ability to go to court to force us to make the payments. So I have uh, just a few more slides in here. I'm not going to go on these in great detail, but we, we were asked to have our actuary evaluate the savings associated with this. And Dan talked about those two additional revenue streams that are going to go into the pensions, that 10% actuarial savings every year, that will go in as well in the so-called Fortner money, which is the bond money that will be redirected. But this bill, Senate Bill 1, was scored by two different actuaries, by the actuaries for the state retirement systems and the commission's actuary, Siegel. And if you look at the top uh, bracket there, we look at Siegel total. Siegel, our, our consulting actuary again, estimated that these changes would save about $137.4 billion over the long term. And the retirement system actuaries came in at about $145 billion. So, no two actuaries ever are going to arrive at exactly the same spot, but, and again, when, we, when the actuaries look at future events, when they try to predict the future, they use the best assumptions they have available to them. So when we portray this, when we present these numbers, we say, well, this is an acceptable range, anywhere between 137.5 and 145 in savings. So that is the actuarial scoring of Senate Bill 1. I've covered the provisions of the bill. That brings my prepared remarks to a close. And at this time, we'd be happy to entertain any questions. If Dan, you want to come back up and help me uh, take questions? We have a microphone in the center aisle here if anybody wants to step up and grill us. Please feel free. Um, my question deals with what if the state constitution uh, or the U.S. the state Supreme Court actually ruled in our favor? What happens to the to the state budgets and so forth? The, the state has argued that here's some rather draconian results as a result of the pension uh, obligation that the state continuing. Have you done any estimates on what happens if? If we are successful and the tax increase does not pass. Well, let me take a shot at that and then comment too. Well, we, we're, under the, we're under a current plan that gets us to 90% by 2045, and that would continue. I, obviously, we do still struggle in terms of, uh, in terms of the unfunded liability. I, like uh, Dan mentioned, it, it doesn't really cover the both the, uh, the actual cost, the normal cost plus the interest until about 2033 or so. So it would just continue. Uh, it depends, the bond houses might lower our rating further, that's for sure, they, they've indicated that. Or if you continue the uh, tax increase, you could direct more of the money into the pension systems. That's, that's what would have to happen. I, I don't think that, you know, the employees are already paying their part. They, the, uh, the systems in recent years, as I mentioned, have already lowered their assumed rate. So that means there's less revenue coming in from the interest income based on the actual study. So it'd simply have to be more state resources put towards it and we'd have to maintain the current plan and the General Assembly could easily go back and look at President Cullerton's idea and maybe pass a different bill that has uh, consideration. Any comments on that? What I, find, uh, what I find interesting is uh, that the uh, political debate has been focused primarily on using the pension system as the uh, way of balancing the overall state budget. With the net result that a lot of the pain in balancing the state budget has been put on to retirees without any consideration whatsoever. And why hasn't the General Assembly and the government uh, taken that 
take a broader view in terms of balancing the state budget and bringing everything into balance uh, equally across all the other areas of uh, governmental expenditure. Well, it's, pensions always in there competing for dollars, even though statutory they're supposed to contribute X amount, they pass laws and when was it back in 2004 or somewhere in that range where it just shorted the pension systems two billion over two years over two years um they'd rather fund education they'd obviously rather fund uh, medicare and human services and those types of competing uh, sources for revenue than pensions i mean that's that's kind of the bottom line it's uh, much easier to you, you know it's They'd much rather have something that they can go home and talk about. You know, they can say, we got more money for education. Yes, ma'am. Uh, early on, you were talking about the situation in Illinois, where there's, a, there's been a lag in the uh, employment rate. Uh, and you were talking about how the poor business environment. And Illinois is not a poor state. So I'd like you to address uh, why we seem to be laggards in the, in the Midwest and just in general. No, it's not a poor state. It's one of the bigger states, but in, in terms of job growth, we've consistently um, trailed the, the nation in terms of the unemployment rate. Um, prior to the Great Recession, even in the last recession, we never recovered all the jobs that were lost. And I think we're just not uh, looked upon, rightly or wrongly, as a very business-friendly state. Um, we probably are seen as a, a higher tax state. We're competing against a number of states that have no income tax. They have much lower inheritance taxes. Um, one of the legislators approached me one time and asked us to look at this, you know, um, people moving out of the state, because I think a lot of them in his district, particularly those who may have significant wealth, are moving out of the state and moving to Florida or Tennessee or someplace where there is no income tax or much lower inheritance taxes. Um, I think there's a lot of overregulation. I don't think it's uh, quite as easy maybe to start a business here or grow a business in Illinois, and some of it's just perception. You look at those studies. We're not ranked very high. And we're not looked upon as being a real business-friendly state, and I think all those, all those do have issues. I always say, well, when's the last time, you know, we have you know, John Deere's located here and Caterpillar's located here in ADM, but when's the last time they built or expanded a facility in Illinois? You just don't see it. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 